Susie, it's so nice to see you. And I love your little Eliza shit setup. <laughs> oh, thank you. Isn't it fun? Yeah, I'm in transit, so I'm like, I don't really have a studio because I'm, I'm moving around so much, but hopefully, hopefully in the summertime I'm going to set something up. So good. I actually, um, I brought us all back. To, I, I returned to CEO like four months ago and had my offices all redone. And this is my office uh, wall at my um, office. But the funny thing is I have a conference room next to my office. But I sit every single day in the conference room and I never sit here, ever. So I had this beautiful background, this gorgeous table, desk, and I never sit here. So <laughs> I thought this is a good opportunity. <laughs> I love it. Wait, so you returned to being the CEO because I just I was reading yep. that you you left and you were doing you were traveling and you were just doing a live OS and you're back. You can't I'm you're back. addicted. You're addicted. You have to. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yes and uh possibly. You know, I had to return back about four and a half months ago. Um, but it was re- it's really good. It was it was shocking. You know, I was retired. I was not planning on it. And when I realized I had to return, I was like, oh, boy. I knew I had a choice to either replace the CEO I had or to uh, return back. And I'm 100% convinced I'm not a good side passenger driver. It's really hard to be a good uh, side passenger driver. It is. It is. I'm way better with the steering wheel. So um, I completely restructured my company, redid everything, uh, rewrote every job description, put in KPIs for the first time in my life. It's been really challenging and exciting. KPIs are the best, though, because it's like you have a goal and you can see it. And you're like, these are our KPIs. And if we don't hit them, then we're not hitting our KPIs. Yeah, but I've never ran my business that way. It was really fun. It, it worked uh, for, you know, 14 years without them, but it, I realized there's a time like, oh, okay, we're big enough now. We probably need to get a little more serious here. Yeah, and it's it's hard to just adjust gears, right, because you're in a different mindset, and you already are like, okay, I, I'm doing this, and then you're like, okay, let's shift gears, and let me put on a different hat, and let me get back into this, and let me start working on it. On KPIs. Completely. Yeah. I've never ever used, I, I don't think I've ever used my left brain so much as I have the past four and a half months. It's like really exercised. I'm more of a right brain creative and it's actually been really fun. Uh, it's amazing how much I've learned about my business. Yeah. Well, you, you know, um, business is so creative and I think that's something they don't teach you in school. Like they teach you the arts and they teach you theater and they teach you all this creative stuff. And, and that's how I came about business too. And you know, and then once you start doing business, you're like, I have a whole new tool set to play with. And it's ultimate creativity because you get to work with creatives too. Yeah, completely. Yeah, it's incredible. And okay, so, um, so I ask every guest, uh, what was your dream as a kid? You know, um, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional environment, so I didn't have a lot of truly childhood dreams. Um, Actually, you know, my dream growing up, my plan was to work at the post office or to get a government, like some sort of government job or work at a factory because you make good money, you know. Um, But what I did naturally as a child, which my mentor Gay Hendricks talks about how it gives hints to your zone of genius, is I was always a maker. Um, I always just made things and created things. People call me a creator. You know, like I love creating and sharing. So I'm in business not because I love business. It's because I can't stop creating. I just, you know, you know, like right now I've been making, I, I built a sewing factory in my basement. And I've been making all these cute little scarves for all my friends and family. And, you know, and they're like, you should do a scarf line, I'm like a clothing line. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. But right now I'm just making little scarves. They're so cute. Yeah, every idea has a new challenge, right? Because you get excited about it, and you're like, yes, I'm going to make that. But then you're like, okay, warehouse, storage, distribution. It it just gets into, like, another level of uh, difficulty and and your time. And uh, and in a way, you kind of built your own factory, right? Like, (laughs) you built your own factory with Poopery. So in a weird way, like, your dream kind of came around. But you kind of always want to be a factory owner. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. I thought I was the one to work in the factory. I thought, you know, wow, you're really set, you know, if you can get a job in the factory, um, which is just absolutely hilarious. That's hilarious. So how did you, um, how did you come around 
to creating a live OS? Like what moved you to create a live? So after my second bankruptcy, when I was 38, this was like uh, 2001, um, around that. I, well, it was 1999, I guess. But um, I, it was in the stock market crash of 2001. So I went into a really deep depression and started a spiritual sabbatical. Like I went on a spiritual sabbatical for about four years. Um, I decided I'm the worst business person in the world. I don't want anything to do with business at all. Um, and the wonderful part of that journey of being completely flattened, what I now call the luxury of losing everything, that whenever I lost everything, I was able to really see what I was up to and start this really inside journey within myself. And I became happy for the first time in my life. And I had no external, you know, I didn't have a car or, you know, my cars got repossessed, my house got repossessed. So I didn't have any of the material things that we contribute to success. But I knew where abundance was inside. I knew that it was an internal state of, you know, vibration, that it was an energy. And I wrote a course uh, 15 years ago called, in, it's probably 16 years ago now, called Inside Out, How to Create a Life You Desire by Going Within. And it was all based on this book called The Game of Life um, and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. She was this amazing metaphysician that taught metaphysics in her basement in 1900 and self-published a book, like rad woman, right? Amazing. Imagine, in 1900, yeah, 120 years ago. She's you know, teaching these metaphysics class in her basement about how basically how to manifest, how reality works. So I wrote this course and had five women in it. And then what happened was nobody finished the course. You know, everybody just kind of petered off and I didn't even finish writing it. And I was like, oh, I haven't created external success the way people think. I'm talking about abundance, but I just filed bankruptcy, right? So, of course, as um, things would be, a few months later, I had the idea for Poopery, and I have been on this tangent for, you know, 14 years, and um, which has been such a blessing. So, about three years ago, I had an astrology reading, and this astrologer said, you did something 13 years ago the world wasn't ready for, and they're ready for it now. And I was like, really? And she goes, yeah. And I looked down and my ex-husband had just brought this old binder that he found in some of our you know, stuff from the, the attic. And my assistant had put it on my desk and I looked down and I went, I wrote this course like 13 years ago. And she goes, yeah, you know, you're gonna be teaching about money and abundance and energy. And I was like, oh my God, like I wrote this. So anyway, that went away, you know, that went in my mind for a few months. And one of my um, coaches at the time was JP Sears. And he asked me a question, and he said, there's a quote from Joseph Campbell, the cave you fear holds the treasure you seek. So the cave you fear holds the treasure you seek. And he said, what is in your cave of fear that's so scary that you can't even utter the words? Like, what is that dream that's so big that you thought was absolutely impossible? And I couldn't even hardly say it. I was snot crying. And I said that I'm a global spiritual leader. And I still get a little, ooh, with that. And anyway, I get through that process. And he's like, so what are you going to do? You know, what's your first action step? And I looked down at this binder. And I was like, I'm going to rewrite this course that I wrote 13, you know, 14 years ago then. And uh, so I asked 25 women here in Dallas if they would be my accountability partners. And I said, I'll deliver a course every two weeks. I'll write eight courses. And would you be willing to go through this and be, you know, just listen to whatever I write every two weeks? So they did it. And it was incredible. Everybody's lives changed. And um, I still didn't, that was like November of 2019. And I still didn't do anything with it. It's still like, okay, the holidays, the new year. I still wasn't motivated. And then about April, people were having such a hard time during the pandemic that one of my friends said, listen, like you've got this amazing course. It changed our lives. And women especially need to be hearing this right now. So will you take it online? And that was the first time I taught it, it was in April of uh, last year, April of 2020. So I took it online. Um, gave a lot of scholarships, probably half our class was to black women. Um, and it's just been incredible. 
So I've taught hundreds of students since. I think I've taught it, it five times. I wrote an Alive Abundance course. In the next few months, I'm writing a live business. So um, I'm tackling all kinds of areas. That's a long story, but <laughs> it's interesting to see the manifest, uh, what we call manifestation or the actualization. I like that word better, the actualization of how the course came to be. Right, you know, like sometimes things make more sense when you start writing them out in a timeline. Like if I'm not sure about like my story or something, I'll just write a timeline and then I'll see things in it that like I didn't even realize I saw it. Oh. And it, it's so interesting to like just create timelines and just go, oh, okay, so that how that that fits into it. And I'm really big into astrology too. I um, I helped um, launch this app. It's called uh, the Daily Hunch, and they use like all your transits. It's a custom astrology thing. Oh. And it's like it's I'm really into astrology. Like I'm that passionate about <laughs> astrology, and I think astrology also shapes who we are. And I think. If people are into astrology, they're going to be open a little bit more to manifesting because I try to explain manifestation to a lot of different people. And sometimes some look at me like I'm completely nuts, but others are like, oh, yeah, I totally get it. I'm a manifester. Like, I understand it. So it's really interesting to help people understand this concept and help people understand energy and flow and what it's like to live as a three dimensional human in this plane. Because I think a lot of people go through their life not connected to anything, and they're asleep. You know, so it's it's hard to to kind of like wake them up, and I think this is the perfect way to get them to start thinking about like how much bigger can their life be. You know? I think so, and I think sometimes you know this is the whole thing like you know they're asleep, and I think at various times we all have parts of ourselves that are asleep. You know, we're all multi-dimensional beings. You know, like I may have a part of me that's asleep. I'm not in a relationship right now. You know, so that's pretty dormant and kind of asleep. I'm not in a romantic relationship. You know, but my business, you know, is actually pretty awake, or my spirituality, or my spiritual practice is pretty awake. Or sometimes, like my meditation right now has been a little. You know, I did a lot of medicine journeys last year, and I've been trying to get my meditation back. So I think we have varying levels of asleep and awake. You know, and it's like, yeah, what what may be awake right now. Well, it's also the amount of energy you can put into it, right? Because your business might be taking away more energy, and a piece of that energy can be put towards relationships. But since you're totally. not putting that energy into relationships, then there are no relationships coming out because the universe right. is not getting the signal that you want a relationship. Because to the universe, you look like you're busy and you don't want it. So, so I think all those things are so interesting and i was going to ask you if you remember your very first alive moment right speaking of waking up and like feeling alive well i, I you know hindsight's always 2020 right um so what i do remember and one of the things that really was the catalyst for this work you know while i wrote that i knew that abundance and alive actually in my course alive actually stands for abundance lives in a vibration of energy um i knew where it dwelt within a being i knew that it's a state of being within oneself but i didn't actually understand what it feels like when um this Ah, evolutionary impulse comes in to your your being when that uh, cosmic you know big bang and that happened when the idea for poopery came about um, I didn't quite understand it at the time but I remember somebody said like hey can bathroom motor be trapped we were in a small house with a you know big family and I remember like this little zing up my arm and it's like the room kind of went high def and I completely saw, I work with essential oils, oil floats on water and I looked and I go, I can do this. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like it was that moment of just like, um, I've been plugged into a light socket. I absolutely saw it all. I knew I could do it. It took me nine months in the actual world. But looking back now, what I teach about going towards alive ideas or things that turn us on, I can go back and go, oh, that's what that was, right? And prior to that, I'm sure that I had those moments of insight in before. But one of my teachers, um, she's passed away now. Um, uh, she was one of my mentors, Barbara Marks Hubbard, used to say that these 
impulses within us are actually evolutionary impulses. They are evolution itself telling us exactly what it needs in order to evolve. Isn't that radical? I love that. It's also like a level of survival that you want to live at, right? Do you want to survive or do you want to like survive and thrive, right? It's like what yeah. level of survival will you be comfortable with? Like what will it take for you to survive? You know, yeah. it's, and I like to think it's also like my, my future self kind of guiding me. I wrote letters to myself when I was younger and I wonder if you did anything like that when you were younger like if you feel like you have a higher self guiding you towards your goals in a way like you speaking to you from the future yeah you know i'll tell you i went through astrologically speaking um i i had no idea this astro i've never been into astrology really i'm told these astrology stories but i sort of roll my eyes they're like oh your 12th house and your 10th house and i'm like oh my god you know, I remember a, a shaman down in Peru telling me like 13 years ago, the more complicated it is, the further it is from love. So I've always tried to keep my life pretty simple, right? And sometimes all the houses and they're all, I'm like, oh, Lord. But she did tell me that this year, I guess my Pluto's in transit and they call it Hades, where you face your actually deepest, darkest fears. So I've been going through that this year and it has been beyond intense, the most intense time I've had in 20 years. But what I've been realizing is that I'm not even sure about even the word manifesting anymore. I um, have been more in a place of surrender and watching. I'm not even sure if I'm being guided by a higher purpose or my own evolutionary impulse or something within me. It's almost like all of that belief that I really, really held so tightly has started unwinding this year. So I don't know if I'm guided by a higher purpose. I don't know. I do like to believe that there is a God, and that is my personal belief. But do I actually know it's true? Of course I don't know it's true. Nobody knows if it's true. Um, so I really just been, as I've been down in Hades this year, just really looking at so many structures that I had that I absolutely thought were true. I'm not even sure I've manifested anything. And I don't even use those words anymore. You know what I do know is I've created a lot of spaciousness in my being. And that spaciousness that I keep creating, things seem to fill it. So we could call that manifestation. Um, but very little of what I've actually wanted has come into be. And I actually think we can limit ourselves with manifestation. And, and trust me, I've been out there talking manifestation for the past, you know, at least five, six years and on a personal level for probably a good 20. And now I'm rewinding all of that. Going, Why would you even want to limit yourself with some sort of manifestation? Why wouldn't you be open to and being curious to what life has to deliver, right? And yeah. So it's really fun this year. I think so. You know, I think once you put it into like your heart space that you want something, the universe is going to deliver something even bigger than you imagined. But I think it's just wanting it to begin with and then kind of like putting it away and just going, okay, like that, that'll be nice. And like, let me just focus on my thing and see what, see what the universe will bring. Because I think your imagination is nothing compared to what the universe has in store sometimes for better or for worse <laughs> and again i don't even know what i want like why would i even think about what i want it's like you know what i want what i'm given so it's really funny so i was in the camp of byron katie 18 years ago do you know byron katie mm -hmm. loving what is okay yeah. so i was in her camp for that four my four-year sabbatical and i was so loving what is and surrendering and being open and curious I have spent 18 years, and I'm back where I was 18 years ago. <laughs> I, I went it. through, I went through testing. Trust me, I, I really, I would bet you a lot of money that no one's done more personal development workshops. You know, I've done over 150 hallucinogenic journeys. Like I have explored this shit. Okay, I'm not. I haven't been sitting back being passive. Like anybody that knows me knows, like I've done a lot of work, and now I'm like, for what? <laughs> you know, I'm really back where I was 18 years ago going, everything's perfect. It's great. 
<laughs> well, right down, right. Eventually, like five years down the line, right when you start making those linear things, you'll be like, ah, this is what it was all about, right? Aha. Okay, yeah. this is where it's going. It, so it all works out. It all works out. Yeah. Say, have you thought about implementing KPIs in your personal life? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not even interested. You know, I just. Oh, like I said, it's been more like um, I've been more of a place of surrender and curious than I've been in many, many, many years. Just kind of like, I don't know. Well, let's see. Maybe, maybe. People always ask me, like, you know, does I, I went to this lunch um, about a month ago and these this game designer and we were talking about, you know, is, is this life a simulation? I'm like, maybe. And they're like, well, you know, do you believe in a creator? I'm like, maybe. And they're like, do you believe in everything? Is happening? I don't know. I'm back to, I don't know anymore. And it's an awesome place to be internally within me. It frustrates everyone else. But I'm a little like, I don't know anymore. And it's really kind of, free. I feel free, if that makes yeah. sense. No, it does. You know, I always think that deja vu is some kind of a glitch in the matrix. Like if it's a simulation... Yeah. Maybe the deja vu is like, oh, you've been here before, you've done this before, you're on the right path. So I, I try to look yeah. at deja vu as like, okay, that there's a glitch in the system, and like maybe it's a reminder of the matrix. But I was gonna ask you, what has been your favorite? Be. What has been your favorite uh, drug experience? I love drug experiences as well. So I, you know, I think a lot more people should be open to them because I mean now everything is coming to light, right? MDMA research. Uh, they're even working on LSD, mushroom therapy, and things are, in the last 10 years, things have been so much more open. You know, ayahuasca retreats are now popular, where like 10 years ago, you couldn't talk about this stuff. It was like so taboo. And I was going to... Trust me. Trust <laughs> me. I was that person. Yeah, I started going down to the jungles in Peru like 14 years ago, and I did not tell. I mean, I knew like probably three people around me, my three employees when I first started the company. I would leave them for two weeks and go down to the jungle. I'm like, I got to go drink ayahuasca. Um, and I've never done, I've only done what we would call drugs. Uh, I did LSD once at a, uh, at a festival, but I've only done, all of my journeys have been in therapeutic settings mm -hmm. um, with shamans or something. But... You know, I don't know. It all depends upon. I'm a. I, last year, I did. I did ten ketamine journeys. I'm not a fan of. Uh, I think that's probably what jacked with my meditation. It's an. It's anesthesia. Yeah. After, oh, at the I, end. At, at the end of the day, it cat, does. It's cat tranquilizer, right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So um, it is really good. I was working on attachment. Um, like an anxious attachment, it did solve that issue, but I think it had other repercussions. So I'm a fan of any of the naturals, you know, like um, ayahuasca, psilocybin, uh, sassafras, anything that is grown of the earth, I'm way more a fan of. And, and again, honestly, just last night, you know, all these people were talking about ayahuasca, and I'm like, you know, I just don't know if I'll ever do any another hallucinogenic journey as long as I live. I feel good. So, again, I don't know. Well, you know, it, you have to approach it from a point of, like, trying to download information, right? You kind of can't go into it just, like, just as you are because you're not going to get that much out of it. So it has to be a place where you're really trying to find answers, right? And... Um, and I think it's always, it's always interesting what you can discover about yourself and, and what the plants can teach you, what nature can teach you, and like what insight mm. you can. And again, it's, it's going back to energy work, right? It's the en energy of the universe moving through the earth, moving through the plants, moving through you, and everything is like one. And you kind of tap in. It's, I kind of ca call it like going online, right? It's like a different form of an internet. You can come in and you can... You have to be ready for the journey, and you just come out with a little bit more information, hopefully, than than you had before. But I don't think you can just, yeah. you know, go into it just just fooling around because it's serious stuff. It's very powerful, powerful medicine. Yeah, I do believe that there's a lot to um, be said for opening up space. You know, most of us have filled and filled and filled. And if you think about ayahuasca, it's a purgative. You know, you're literally yeah. puking up these energies, um, supposedly. 
and uh, but what it, it does create some space, which is really nice. So it is a, a it, they are wonderful, I think, to stop and kind of expand your consciousness into something much bigger than yourself. And you know, you keep on mentioning the word space too, and it makes me think of the goldfish idea, right? You are only gonna be as large as a goldfish as like the bowl that you're put in, right? So if you're in a small mm -hmm. bowl, it's gonna be a small bowl for the whole entire life, but if, if they put you into a big bowl, you're gonna, you're gonna get a little bigger and you're gonna expand mm -hmm. in, in a way it, it's, um, I, I like to think about like, you know, what bowl will fit you? What bowl will you be happy with? And how can you find that bowl? And how can you, how can you create your own bowl? <laughs> and who's determining the size of the bowl? Right. I remember I did, I did one ayahuasca journey and I came out and I was like, I'm going to open a company called What Box. People were like, what? And I was like, yeah. I always, people always say, think outside the box. And I'm always like, what box? Like, where's the, who, who made the box? Where's the box? <laughs> so where's the bowl? Where is that bowl? Show me. <laughs> well, we say, what is it? Squaring the circle, squaring the circle, thinking outside the box. It's, it's all these mm -hmm. metaphorical things we use, but it, you're right. You're totally right. And, and, you know, speaking of inside the box and outside the box, you know, how does one manifest the life they desire through energy work? Like, you know, how do you manifest this bowl? How, how do you manifest being a fish? Can you manifest being something else? You know? Well, I'm not sure that you can. Again, like I said, I'm not sure. I don't know. What what my practice has been um, lately is the opposite of manifestation. It's uh, the opposite of what most manifesting teaches. You know, most, most of the times you're taught to want this and then you think positive and you're going to vibrate and be aligned with that. I'm not even sure if that's true anymore. Abraham Hicks is going to come and knock me over the head. Um, what I do believe is that um, what I... I'm saying what I believe, what my experience is, is the more I clear internally and create more uh, peace, that's just a, a better way of saying it, within myself, the more things seem externally to come. So it's the opposite, because what happens is when you really think about it, I'm just I'm just starting to call game on the whole manifesting yeah, manifesting totally. thing. Because think about this, think about this. I want a million dollars, right? I want a million dollars. What that actually does is, in a wild way, it roots the fact that you don't have a million dollars, right? And they say, oh well, you know, you need to really feel a million dollars. Well, you can't feel it because you've never had it. You can try to imagine what you think it feels like. And so all of this to me is a lot of work. The way I would, I've preferred to work in the past few years is let me just keep clearing space within myself. Let me, anytime I feel like a, a feeling or emotion, I want to kind of be like, ooh, what's that? Ooh, you know, I go into that. I, I, I feel it. And then that sort of like gets resolved. And then what happens is things start coming in. And I'm like, well, that's cool. Now, the trick is, I don't believe you can do that in order to get it because then you're in the same manifestation loop. Like, I'm going to clear so I can have a lot of good shit in my life, right? Well, now you're back in the lack again. So it's a really tricky kind of interesting ninja move. Can I be okay with what is? And can I fully surrender to this moment? And then can I be open to whatever life has to deliver me, good, bad, what we label as good or bad, right? And then can I just be present within that experience and my 100% you know, track record experience is I'm blown away by what life keeps offering that I could have never even conceived within my rational right. mind. It's so interesting. I, I think about that too, and I think about every time I, I do a jump in my career and whatever I'm building, you know, I, I try to just spend some time just thinking and clearing space and thinking about what what I need to eliminate in order to get to the next level, right? Like, how how do you like to clear everything? Like, do you have a do you have a way to do it? Do you just sit there and you're just like 
okay, this is, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm clearing it. Do you make a list? Like, what is your method for clearing? Yeah, I think, again, it's about being present in the moment. You know, it's like, you know, like right now. You know, if I were looking at clearing, I'd be like, I've got a tension in my jaw, right? That tells me in studying body intelligence that there's some anger. And I'd be like, ooh, what do I feel angry about? <laughs> right? right. <laughs> it feels kind of juicy. And then I just kind of go into that. Like, can I express anger and can I feel this anger that's present within my body? Um, or, you know, if I feel um, a couple of days ago, I had this real big feeling of humiliation. You know, it was just like, oh, I'm so humiliated. And I literally just sat and felt it. Like, I can feel it in my belly right now. And I just felt humiliation. And then I just really got to love, you know, I got to see it when I was a little girl. And, you know, it was just like, oh, my God, the one that actually thinks she could do something wrong. And, you know, but, it, but I just, it, whatever arises in the moment, I don't really think. Now, and there are some things that have been a little more difficult for me to clear on my own. And that's when I reach out to, you know, like my mentor, Gay Hendricks, or a therapist, and I kind of go, you know, it's been three days. I haven't been able to clear this energy. I still keep feeling this feeling. So, you know, there's some protective mechanisms around me that's not wanting to feel it. So I use them as a spotter to kind of go, I need to go in here where you kind of hold space because there's something pretty gnarly in here that feels like you know it never is but it can That's feel that way you know, I never thought about going to someone to help with clarion but like that totally makes sense right like if your car has a check engine on you take it into a shop so this is it's really brilliant and it's really nice to hear that um you know coming from you um what else I was going to ask you um you know like one question I have, which I didn't even write down, is you built such a huge business with three children. Two children or three children? I forget. Two. Three. And three. I three. just three. have, mm-hmm. I have a 10-month-old. My husband is out for a walk with a baby right now. And I'm like, how do I adjust? I'm like, how did, how did Susie build a business with three children? And I know you're probably like, I am, I'm amazing and this is what I do. But like, how do you, how, how, how? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll answer that question with a story. So um, I have a senior VP of creative here. She's incredible. She's, you know, just she's been with me, I think, eight or nine years. Uh, she's in her 30s. And when she had her first baby two and a half years ago, she told me she was, she, you know, she took her maternity leave and she said she's ready to come back to work. And I said, no, don't come back to work. And she said, I want to. And I said, you know, one of my biggest regrets is not being home with my children. So, and I said, you know, I don't believe in the, I don't remember, was it Cheryl Sandberg? Lean in. I don't remember. I don't believe in these. I don't believe you can have it all. You can't have it all. Something is going to sacrifice. So one of my deepest uh, regrets is that I wasn't in a position where I could spend more time with my children and uh, a compromise I made for her is she could come back to work if we gave her a big office and put a nanny in there. So, um, yeah, I know. We can't do it now. We tried to do it for a few more people afterwards, and there's all kinds of HR laws where you have to be a daycare. It's, it, it got, you know, our naivety um, let us do it for a year, which was really amazing. You know, um, so the baby's name's Lucy, and I was in every meeting holding her. So she was really birthed in a community but that was a very abnormal environment. So I sacrificed a lot of time uh, with my children that I would trade back all the money I have to have that time back again. I just want to give you a hug right now. I want to give you a hug. I want to give you a hug. Yeah, it's just, it's just trying to figure things out, right? And trying to like, it, it's like, where, where do you put your energy, right? Where do you put your energy? Yes. What's my priorities? Yeah, yeah what's, what? where are my priorities? And I had pretty screwed up priorities. I really thought that success in business and me being successful was the most important thing to me. And when I look back now, it's like, 
girl, you had those priorities all screwed up, like completely screwed up. And it seemingly worked out well. You know, my children are happy, but I live with the uh, regret of the trade-offs. And, um, you know, I had to trade off. I don't believe you can have it all. And I think it's... um, I think, again, it goes back to survival mode, right? Like, I'm sure at that time you were in survival mode and you were like, I'm building something for my children so they don't have to be how I was. You know, like, I'm sure it all goes back to, like... Completely. All of that. And it's... Yeah. It's this is what we have to deal with all the time and it's it's hard yeah and none of and none of my kids are because interested they grew, in they're growing up with it it's so i'm like oh my god <laughs> they're all they're all artists you know they're just like i don't even want money you know my <laughs> older son's into crypto he ran the bitcoin meetings here in dallas because Love he it. thinks we need a new financial system he will not invest in anything that doesn't forward the movement of uh, blockchain technology, even if he can make money. He's just fabulous. My daughter's an artist. My other son's an inventor just making stuff. So, yeah, they're, none of them are really interested, which is really fast. I love it. I'm but like, yeah, gonna keep doing that. But they're going to come into whatever they're doing. And, it, you know, like it's all going to work out in the end, you know. And it's, it's interesting because I see that divide yeah. between my friends and, and myself, you know, I have a story similar to yours. Grew up, with, I'm a Russian immigrant. I came here with a hundred bucks in a suitcase when I was 10 with my mom, you know? So it's like, wow. so it's, it's about like this generation achieving and then doing things. So it's like how, it's a whole entire discussion altogether. It's like, I won't even go into it, but it's how the drive that you have came from where you were. You know, if you if you had something, if you were born into Completely. something else, you would be like, "I'm doing crypto. <laughs> this is what this is what my interest." Totally, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna paint. You know, what? she said, "I'm gonna paint." The Gagosian Gallery, and that's it. And she'll be all set. And like, she'll she'll paint that's her way it. into her life, and yeah. it's gonna be wonderful. But you know, speaking about like resonance and dissonance, um, how does one use resonance and dissonance to transform their reality? We talked about staying away from things that you like and drawing towards things that you like. And again, you know, like your children are resonating with art. <laughs> they are <laughs> clearly dissonancing from money, but, but they're still young. Who knows? You know, who knows? And the NFTs, man. <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> you know, I don't even, I still don't understand it. I'm like, so there's nothing that I buy <laughs> And I still have nothing. Like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, if I buy a piece of NFT art, I oh, you own it. I do. Yeah, okay. Where is it? Well, it's on the internet. Okay. Well, what do I do if I'm going to show somebody that? Well, you can project <laughs> it up on a wall. I'm like, to me, I'm sorry, but we got a little bit of the emperor's new clothes thing going on here, which is pretty fascinating. Um you know, again, just energy. It's like, oh, I'm just going to believe what, a story that's, that's not true. Life okay, is, right? money is a <laughs> give me story something I can touch. Is not true. Like we all chose to believe that money is a thing before we were trading shells and salt, and now we're like, and now it was like gold. Exactly. Now we're trading light. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you want some of my light? I've got, got some. I've got a million dollar light. light. You and you're that? shining that light. And. And, you exactly. Know, you're shining in two corners yeah. of the universe. They need it because there are lots of girls mm-hmm. and there are lots of boys and there are lots of everyone else between boys and girls. You know who need this light and who might be listening and who were in your shoes when when you were little and they're just looking for a light. They're looking for a light so they can turn on their light. Yeah. And they're trying to escape. They're trying to escape that scary place. So you need to be like a little beacon, shining your light so they can find you and they can come alive. So this is. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, speaking of that, resonance and dissonance. So I called Dr. Bruce Lipton. Gosh, I don't know. The words 2017 are coming up. That's probably true. Um, In 2017, and I said, hey, I have this theory that um, ideas are alive. I said, are they alive? And he said, why do you ask? And I said, well, I have this theory that the ideas that I seem that turn me on seem to work out. The ones that I create with my left brain logic, like, oh, there's not a dry cleaner on this, you know, corner. It makes sense to put a dry cleaner here. They, those just never work out. And, um, and I'm just curious about that. And he said, and I said, I just wonder if ideas are alive. 
because he's a cellular biologist. And he said, every living thing is a vibration. So everything is a vibration. Everything down to an atom is a vibration of energy. And then he said, and every living thing is seeking more life force energy. So we are going to be naturally drawn. When you look at a cell in a microscope, it's around looking for more energy. It is within our nature to look for more energy. And then he explained to me resonance and dissonance. And resonance is when you take two energy, and he said this could help you explain what's going on. When you take two energy waves that are the same pattern and same wavelength, so they're the same. You put those two together, they equal a bigger pattern than either of them do apart. So it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals three, four, five, six, depending upon the level of resonance, okay? So, um, and then he said dissonance is the opposite. It's when you have two energy waves that are completely different. You know, one's like this, they're just, they're not one's good and one's bad. Oh, those people are, you know, toxic or whatever. You know, these horrible words we throw out to people. But when they're just different, you're not on the same wavelength and you're not on the same energetic pattern. Those two together create less energy together than they do apart. Now, check that out. So both those together equal less energy than just one of them do by itself. So he says like noise canceling headphones, you put noise canceling headphones on and what they do is that actually those two negative, I mean those two um, cancel each other out and create no energy where you can't hear any sound. So, um, and then he, and what I realized is that the things that, and I try to, keep myself into places of resonance things are actually turning me on and move away from things that are dissonant things that are dragging me down and i know that energetically for example i've had a lot of company this week and it's getting to where i need some alone time it's starting to become dissonant for me it was very exciting i've had a great social life this week and now i'm like coming into my like okay i need to get myself into a better state of resonance because it's becoming dissonant now um, it's just, I'm just a different, this person still is wanting to, you know, um, in, 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 you know, stay with me and, you know, company and let's go out and see things. And I'm at a pattern right now. My energetic pattern is I'm tired. I need rest. I need solitude. So it's just different. It's not that one person's good and one person's bad. It's just dissonant right now. And I may be resonant at another time. So um, one of the things that we do in a live OS is we do clear a lot of the clutter. We talk about a lot about intention integrity, and then we start learning about resonance and dissonance, and we also enter the KV fear. But um, we start looking at those things that are dissonant, that are dragging us down energetically. And energetically, it's like draining your bank account every single time. It doesn't light you up, so you're literally getting less energy than you had before or being at a neutral state. So we start getting, you know, drop some of that stuff, as we start really focusing a little bit more on things that are resonant and we start turning towards. And once we start turning towards, we start being actually more lit up and we get more energy and more life force and you know, life goes on. So I think we are masters in Western civilization at trying to do self-care um, so that we can try to patch the vast amounts of dissonance that we have in our life and try to make it okay um you know and really the truth is this is not turning you on it's actually depleting your life force energy and then all of a sudden we end up with a disease and we are something and we go what happened it's like well what happened is you've been draining so your life true. force and energy it's, this and it's entire time it's four o'clock so and i'm like I'm, I'm very cognizant of our time too so i have one more question left for you um you know, oh, yeah. um, what is your okay. dream as an adult now that you're grown up? Really, the only dream that I kind of have is can I be a curious observer? Um, can I be fully expressed um, in the moment, no matter what I think someone wants to hear? Can I be fully expressed? And can I um, just be present to what, what's up right now in this moment and 
um, be authentic with that. And if I can live the rest of my life like that, that's a beautiful dream. I'm going to be really well, happy. Well, I think you're doing it. You know, like every, <laughs> everything you do sure. is towards it. So I'm excited um, to see what you guys are going to be doing mm. at Poopery. I know so. there were some. There was a Super Bowl ad this year, right? There was last year. Last year, no. No, 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 we didn't. No, uh, no, 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 we haven't done you Super Bowl You had a Bowl Super Bowl campaign, ever. that's what it was. Um, we had a Super yeah. Bowl campaign, but not an ad. Yeah, yeah, we have a big campaign coming out in January, which should be fun and shake awesome. some well, things off. So we've got a lot of fun the, things brewing over you're here. You're back at it. And I, <laughs> you're back in the saddle. And, back um, in the saddle. I'm super excited about the course. I'm going to share all the info um, on the October 1st podcast, and I can't wait for more people to find out about resonance uh, and dissonance and all this wonderful stuff. And I'm also a huge fan of Tesla, and he's got a wonderful quote that I live by that says, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. Think in terms. I, I love That's Tesla. He's like my dream man. Um, he's, That's it. He's, he's amazing. But um, I'm excited to see how Alive OS grows throughout the years, and I'm so happy that you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for we'll making see. the yeah. time. I yeah, appreciate thank you so much. It was so fun. I appreciate it.